My name is Kevin Strauss, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator with Clean River Partners. We're going to be talking about what is a rain garden, since that's what you all are here to learn about. We'll talk about why they're important, how to locate a rain garden for the best location, how to maintain your rain garden, and then how to do a little bit of homework. First part, uh, who is Clean River Partners? We're a nonprofit group. We work on projects all over the Cannon River watershed, which goes from Owatonna up to the Waterville area and a little bit west and north of there, and then all the way east to Redwing. That whole region is the Cannon River watershed. And we believe everyone should have clean rivers and lakes to swim and fish in and be able to drink clean water from our wells. And so we do projects with farmers to put more conservation on the land. We work with cities like the city of Northfield to do stormwater education. And we do big community events like the Cannon River watershed wide cleanup in September, where we gather volunteers to clean up parks and rivers areas all around the region. Here's the watershed that I was mentioning before and you can see a watershed for folks not familiar with the term is all the land that drains to a particular river or lake. So if you look at the map here all the landscape here from Kilkenny and Elysian down to Ellendale and Owatonna all that place where if a raindrop falls there it'll eventually flow its way down to the Cannon River. The reason we work in a watershed scale is because a lot of the the challenges we're running to in clean water are because of land use. And so we have to do projects at that scale. Most of our region is farmland, about 74%. There's some fields as well. Cities are only 1% of the landscape, but proportionately, we provide more than 1% of the runoff pollution that happens in the watershed. And so that's why we do projects like this to help city people do things in the landscape to make sure that the stormwater that flows through town here is as clean as possible. And rain gardens are one of the best ways to do that because they mimic a lot of the natural systems that used to capture and clean up water as it landed in the ground and flowed. The big challenges we're running into in our watershed these days, one is excess soil on the river. You might have seen it after a rainstorm. You'd see the water turn kind of like chocolate milk sort of color, and that's excess sediment, which could come from riverbank erosion. That's the big area these days. Excess fertilizers is another big challenge, and that can come from farm fields, leaking septics, or in the case of cities, it's usually from lawns, either from grass or leaves on the lawn that washes into the storm drain, or fertilizers on the lawns. And rain gardens capture that water and often use up some of those nutrients or fertilizers. Another challenge is excess bacteria. And again, that could come from pets, in the Twin Cities, actually, most bacteria that you run into in the Twin Cities metro area is dog droppings bacteria. So cleaning up after your pets is really important, but also from septic systems and farm fields. So the big things that impact the rain gardens help us with are capturing water so it's not flowing in large amounts down to the river and catching those nutrients or fertilizer. And here's an example of why we need rain gardens. You can see before we had a built up city area here with lots of pavement, generally it would rain. A lot of that water would soak into the soil and into the underground uh, aquifers in the system. And it would then flow underground, eventually go into rivers and lakes, and a lot of it would evaporate. And that was sort of the natural system. We didn't want to have dirt roads, so we built pavement. And the downside of that from a clean water perspective is then we have lots of runoff going right to the river and not a lot soaking into the ground. Rain gardens are going to help us mimic some of those natural systems because they do a better job of capturing and letting that rainwater soak into the ground and also cleaning the water on its way into the ground. A rain garden is generally a dry depression on the landscape. Almost all the time that a rain garden is operating, there isn't going to be water in it. It's generally a dry location. You create a depression or maybe a depression that you have adjusted a little bit. It's planted with native and perennial flowers and grasses, so deep-rooted plants. Often prairie plants are, are a good option, but there are some, some other options that could work for that as well. And the goal of a rain garden is to catch and infiltrate water from roofs, driveways, and sidewalks. So if you think about all the parts of your property that don't naturally soak up water, usually that's rooftops, driveways, sidewalks, those hard surfaces let water flow off very quickly. And the goal of the rain garden is to set it up in a way that it can intercept some of that water, whether it's putting a downspout so it flows right into the rain garden or adjusting how water is flowing off your driveway. They reduce stormwater runoff because whenever we put in more pavement or put in another roof for a building, that speeds up how much water and how fast that water gets onto the streets and down to the river. And we wanna to try to intercept that water and clean it up as much as possible because the more rain that's flowing through a city, down streets especially, the more it's gonna pick up other things on those streets. And that could be things like oil or pet droppings or litter. Since our storm drain system is designed to get water off the streets and out of town as we send it down 
rivers and lakes. And we want to keep the river and lake as clean as possible. Rain gardens help us intercept that water and hang onto it and put it down into the aquifer. Cities with lawns and ball fields, that sort of thing, do recharge some of the aquifer. A rain garden does an even better job because it's designed to catch that water and, and infiltrate it quickly. It's also really pretty. Rain gardens with flowering plants and grasses look really nice. They're a natural landscaping, so they do take some maintenance. They're not maintenance free, but because they have deep rooted systems, these plants do really well in Minnesota. A lot of these native plants were the kind of plants that were here before we, we turn prairies into farm fields and cities. And so they've got deep roots. The native plants we're talking about here are designed for this region. And so they do a great job of handling drought and insects and cold because they're from this area. Being natural landscaping, they're not gonna require a lot of fertilizers or, or a lot of care because they're built for this area. And they'll also attract butterflies, pollinators, and birds because you'll have something there that those wildlife species like. Those flowering plants are a great nectar source. Native landscape versus sort of suburban areas versus urban areas. And you can see the amount of water that, that runs off the landscape increases and that's just a factor of pavement doesn't soak things up. It sends the, the water right off. If it's an area that's been very impacted by human traffic and use, it's not going to soak up as much water as maybe some of the lawns that don't get a lot of traffic on them. But again, we want to try to capture some of that water so it's not rushing right away down to the river. Especially if it's rushing quickly, it also will pick up more fertilizers and pollutants on the way too. So the more we can grab that water and hang on to it, the better. So here we have a cross section. The, the soil in the bottom part here, it looks different from the other soil around it. This is soil that's already in your lawn. Some of it has uh, sediment that has clay in it. Some of it has a little bit more sand, depending on what part of town you're in. But you can see this section here is a different kind of soil. It's created in part of the process of building the rain garden, but it's a different mix of soil. And then there's a section of wood chips on the top of it. There's about six inches of depression here that was created as he created the rain garden so that as the water's flowing in, you'll see it pull up in that area. So here we have our example, we've got the rain coming in and it's flowing. And, and so for a period of up to 24 hours, you'll have some water ponding in that area, but after the rain falls, the water is soaking in. So it doesn't stay ponding more than 24 hours. That's important for lots of reasons. One of them being that if you leave water ponding in your yard too long, then you start encountering things like mosquitoes and that sort of thing. So, so rain gardens are designed to only hold that water for about 24 hours. And then it soaks into the ground. So here's an example kind of a before and after. You can see the house on the bottom. They've done a fair amount of work in terms of putting in a berm around it. The house on the top, they didn't have to do as much of that because of how their landscaping was. They could just put in the, the plants. But depending on your situation, sometimes it works well to put in some kind of berm or stonework with your rain garden. But in many cases, that's not a requirement. One big question that people ask about rain gardens is, does a rain garden form a pond? And from what you know already, does a rain garden form a pond? No. How long should water be in a rain garden? About 24 hours. Yeah, just that, that one day period. Are they breeding grounds for mosquitoes? No, because five, six, seven days is in the range of what mosquitoes are able to lay eggs and breed it. Do they require a lot of maintenance? We haven't talked about that already. They require some maintenance for sure, but, and we'll be talking about this in a little while, you can think about them as requiring as much maintenance as your current lawn, probably not much more than that, and maybe even some less, depending on what you're using in terms of species. And are they expensive? The answer to that question is it, it depends on what you do. It also depends on how much of the work you do on your own. If you are City of Northfield residents on City of Northfield utilities, there is a rebate for installing a rain garden that will reimburse you for some of the cost. And so that can help mitigate some of those costs as well as how you choose to install your rain garden, what plants you use and those sorts of things. One very important thing to be aware of with rain gardens is you're going to be digging on your property. And whenever you dig on your property here in Minnesota, you always call Gopher State One Call. It's the uh, statewide service that identifies all the underground lines on your property before you start digging. And the reason that's really important is you don't want to, as you're building your rain garden, accidentally cut through the internet's cable or the electrical lines or the water line for your property. Those are all things that make your life really exciting in a bad way. And so you want to make sure you know where these are by calling that 800 number. If you looked online and Googled Gopher State One Call, with Clean River Partners projects, we've had events where we've 
put up big tents where you have to pound a big stakes into the ground and you want to know where your water and electrical lines are on the property so you don't accidentally puncture them. But they do a great job of coming out and they're the folks that, that spray paint the lines on your property so you know what's there. And in terms of where to not put a wind gun, you don't want to ever put it over utilities because you don't want to be capturing water and infiltrating that water over utility lines because you're digging and you don't want to break the lines, but also you don't want tons of water flowing right over electrical and other lines. You don't want to be within 10 feet of your foundation. You don't want that water going right into your foundation and your basement. That's no fun for anyone. And so you want them at least 10 feet away from the foundation of your house. You don't want them over your septic tank or fields. If you have a septic field there, you're digging into it, you're damaging your septic field, and the septic field won't be able to do what it does. You don't want them on steep slopes, and people often ask, well, what does steep mean? Generally, if you take a basketball, put it on the ground, and it rolls away, it's too steep. So you want very gentle landscapes that can be a little bit of a, a slope, but not a steep slope that a ball's going to roll down. In the case of my front yard at home, is pretty much my whole front yard is kind of steep, and so you wouldn't want to be setting a, a rain garden in those properties. You also don't want them under the drip line of trees, and there's a couple of reasons for that. The drip line is, if you think about when the leaves are out on your trees, if it rains and, and you're sitting under your tree during a rainstorm, you don't get wet because the, the tree's over you, but once you get to the edge of that foliage and you can start feeling the rain again, that's the edge of the drip Line. And generally speaking, for a tree, the root system goes out pretty far to the edge of that drip line. We know there are a lot of important tree roots underneath that section. Once you get outside of the drip line, there are a lot fewer roots. And so since you're going to be digging, again, having to dig through roots is a lot of work, first of all, but it also will damage your tree to be digging up those live root systems. And so you want to have your rain garden outside of that region. You generally don't put rain gardens underneath the branches of a tree. It doesn't work real well for that to happen. There are ways to do landscaping underneath the tree, but a rain garden is not a, an ideal landscaping thing to happen underneath your tree because you're digging up the roots, which damage the tree. So we wanna already start you down the path of, of success by not running into these biggest challenges. And here's our example uh, of just some general terms of location and slope. And you can see the, the things we've talked about already. The basketball test, you know, generally if you put a basketball in the spot and it doesn't roll, then we know that it's not too steep for the rain garden to happen. And having it close to the down spot then makes it easy to get the water to, the, to your rain garden. And I guess the official slope part, you know, less than a 12% slope, and that's the basketball test again. Less than 30 feet from a down spot can be a good thing too, because then the, the water from your down spot is gonna make it to your rain garden. The circles here gave some examples of ideal locations here we have a deck, but just past the deck might be a good spot with downspouts. The front of the property, a lot of these green spots are located right next to downspouts and so the water's coming out of a downspout all the time when it rains and so finding a way to put a rain garden somewhere near there is a good idea in general. A lot of these locations are sort of on the edge of the property too and so they might be areas where water's already flowing. So looking at drainage from your house, we know some things are not going to soak up water. Your roof isn't going to soak up any water. Well, ideally you don't want your roof to soak up water. You want the roof to shed water. A working roof does not soak up water. And pavement are all parts of your property that are impervious. They're going to drain water. And then you want to look at other areas of your property to look at what might be the best place for you to locate your rain garden. There could also be spots on your property that are not ideal. If you have some soil types on your property that have a lot of clay in them, those are also areas where it's not going to work great to have a rain garden. Um, knowing where your downspouts are is another thing to keep an eye on for where your rain gardens are because downspouts are going to be areas that have a lot of water flowing out of them on a regular basis by being able to, to site a rain garden near there or to put an extension on that downspout to bring the water closer to your rain garden are ways to make sure that once you have, as you're siting your rain garden, you want to site it in a place where it's going to collect a lot of water. Putting a rain garden in a place where you're not going to be able to collect a lot of water. The rain guy's not going to be able to do its job. It might still look pretty, but ideally you want to put it in a spot where there's a lot of water flowing naturally, or you can extend a downspout or something else to collect that water more directly. And also looking at where that water is going. And so rain gardens we mentioned before that you want to put a rain garden in a spot that's a wet piece of your property, because if you have a wet spot in your lawn, that's probably a place where there's a lot of clay soil already. And ideally you want a rain garden to collect that water and then also infiltrate it into the ground. And if you already have a wet spot, that means it's not infiltrating 
properly, you have a lot of clay or something else that's blocking the water from soaking in, it is possible to amend that soil and change it, but it's a whole lot of work. But again, the, those wet spots in your lawn are not the place you want to put a rain garden because rain gardens ideally capture water and then infiltrate it in the process. And also you want to think about where the water is flowing now. In my yard, for instance, it's sort of on a, a hill space and I've got a lot of water that runs off my lawn onto the sidewalk in the side of the property and right down to the storm drain. In terms of, as my wife and I are looking at options for a rain garden, sort of intercepting that flow across the lawn would be good because then it isn't going down the sidewalk and into the storm drain. We're catching that water and infiltrating it before it does. Ideally, you want your rain garden to, to be able to soak up the water from a, a normal rainstorm. You don't want a, your rain garden to be overwhelmed and flooded out and because if too much water is going into your rain garden then it could cause erosion in the rain garden. It could wash out all the wood chips you're having in there and then the wood chips won't be doing their job. So you want to kind of plan out how much water you're expecting to come to this area of your rain garden and so it can that between the basin that's created in the rain garden and the and the soil soaking up the water that that on on most rainstorms the water will come into the rain garden and might fill up to that sort of six inch depression that you've created and that's about it that it's not going up and over the side and outside the rain garden and that takes a little bit of planning but one thing you need to know about is where's the water coming from in your property into that rain garden what's the drainage area and then getting a sense for normal rainstorms in in the Northfield area. That number in in general, the rainfall in this region has been going up. If you look over the last 20, 30 years, depending on the, the numbers you use, a lot of the discussions around rainfall is that we've increased about 20% of the rain. Our rainfall is about 20% more now than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And part of that has to do with global climate change, that the patterns of weather have changed a little bit. And even some of the maps of where flooding can and does happen has changed because of that shift. We do get more big rainstorms now. The four to seven inch rainstorms used to be really rare 20, 30 years ago. Now they're not that rare at all. And thankfully we haven't had floods recently, but you probably remember from news reports that our 100 year floods have happened, in some cases they happen every five or six years. And, and that used to be a really rare thing, now it's not so rare. But as you're sizing your rain garden, you wanna make sure that it, it is big enough and that the water infiltrates into the ground fast enough so that it's not being washed out from that region. And, and part of that has to do with how you do the, the planning for it, which we'll talk about now and then also more technically talk about in the next session as well. And the simple example is doing looking at where the water is coming from to your rain garden. And so if we're talking about the downspout for this house in particular, you'd look at how many square feet of roof are we talking about? We know that 100% of the rain that hits that roof is gonna come down that downspout. And that's how we want it to be. If 100% if of the rain that hits that roof is not coming down the downspout, there's a different problem you have to deal with. You have a leak in your roof, that's a whole different topic. But we assume that it's all coming off the roof and going down the downspout. And in this case, you want your rain garden to be catching that water and soaking it up and, and sending it down into the soil. And so here it was a, a little math example. The, the total roof area is 150 square feet. For the, the top roof area, let's see, there we go. 350 square feet for the bottom roof area. And so you have 500 square feet of drainage area. And so, and then you also wanna look at the soil type and doing a little infiltration test. And, and this is an example of to figure out how long it takes for rainfall on your lawn to soak into the ground. Getting a sense for how long it takes for water to soak into the ground. I mean, if you have a lot of clay in your soil, it might only be 0.15 inches per hour. If you have a more silty or loamy soil, which when you think about dirt, dirt in your lawn, we usually think about a silt or a loam to it. And that might be half an inch an hour if you have a really sandy kind of soil. I mean, if you have a sandy soil, then you could be soaking in an inch of rain per hour. And you want to select a rain garden depth that drains in 24 hours and so if we get a five or six inch rainfall and your soil type will absorb half an inch per hour well then you let five or six inches of rain will soak in in 10 hours which is great because you have plenty of time then for that to soak in and here's an example of the percolation test and and oh and here's here are the steps of how you do it you dig a hole you fill it with water you wait a few hours and then you fill it with water again and put in a ruler and figure out how many inches has the water level gone down and that's the example of figuring out the rain garden depth in a lot of cases that six inch depth works for a lot of soil types but you want to be more specific in your property to make sure it's right but on average that's a 
pretty common rain garden depth is having six inch deep rain garden by the time you're done. But again, that depends a whole lot on the soil types. And so in that, the, in the examples here, for if you have really clay soils, you want three to five inches of rain garden depth. So that's the, the sort of depression created in your rain garden. Once you've amended the soil and put in wood chips, you'll have that sort of six to nine inch depth is usually the target. And, and again, that depends a little bit on the surface area, which then brings us to the Thing, another thing you have to think about, and once you've sort of calculated out where your garden's gonna be, rain garden's gonna be, how big is it gonna be, how much depth do you need in the depression for it to catch the right amount of water, and then you have to figure out what kind of plants do you wanna have in there. And so there are a couple of sort of general ideas. We'll talk more specifically plant species in the next section, but in general, you have to know what's gonna grow in your area. Is it a sunny spot or a shady spot? And how much soil moisture variances are gonna be? Is it, an, if you have really sandy soil, then there are gonna be times where, you you know, you want plants that are going to be able to handle drying out because sandy soil tends to dry out pretty fast. If you have really clay soil, then that might impact what sort of plants are going to do well there as well. And also some of the aesthetics. A lot of folks when they're planting out a rain garden don't want all plants that are going to bloom in the spring and then nothing else for the rest of the year. A lot of folks as they're planting it out will have some things that bloom in the spring, some that will bloom in the summer, some that will bloom in the fall, so that you have that constant change of the plants. Some folks will definitely plants that will attract different animals. If you want butterflies and bees coming to your yard, then there are some plants that are great for that. Other folks, if they're not as concerned about pollinators, might just want some tall grasses or, or other reasons. So you have lots of choices as you're thinking about that. And then also, you'll also have some opportunities to think about about costs because you can buy smaller plugs of plants that are not very big that are fairly inexpensive or the the partly grown plants that are more expensive and so that comes down to the cost part of the system and also why use native plants and and we talked about this a little bit before but generally perennials will top the environment here a lot more easily than non-native plants they don't require a lot of fertilizers or pesticides once they're in they take care of themselves pretty well they're not going to require a whole lot of labor to keep caring for them it's not that a rain garden doesn't have any maintenance there's some as we'll talk about in just a minute but not as not a, a huge amount the way that some cultivated plants that are non-native require a lot of work to keep them happy they also have deep root systems and depending on the species you can see some of them have 15 foot root systems that go down into the ground, which are great. Lawn, generally the amount of roots for turf lawn, Kentucky bluegrass, is the same height as the grass is. So if you have, if you cut your lawn at two or three inches, you have two or three inches of roots below that. A lot of cases for when we're recommending river friendly laws, we encourage folks to let the lawn get to three or four inches. And then that gives you about three or four inches of root system, which helps your lawn deal with drought, but also helps it also compete with weeds. So you don't need to use as many pesticides in your lawn. So native plant, really great root systems. They're designed for this part of the country. So they'll be able to deal with insects and other problems in here. They also attract native wildlife. And if after this workshop, Shop. If everyone here wants to put in a rain garden, that's great. If you decide that rain gardens aren't going to work for various reasons in your property, there is another option you have with the city. In addition to rain gardens, we're also encouraged, the city of Northfield is encouraging you to put in native plants for these other benefits too. And so if it turns out that a rain garden isn't in your future, think about looking at native plants because in addition to the rain garden rebate, there's also a native plant planting rebate that you can apply for. And these provide some benefits for lawns and also clean water, it, that if a rain garden isn't gonna work in your property, native plants will provide some of those same benefits in terms of being deeply rooted and, and catching some of that rainwater as well. And the last section we're gonna talk about here is just sort of yearly maintenance. The early spring, if you have sort of tall plants, you wanna cut back the winter stand to, to create some space for the spring plants. And depending on if you have grasses or bushes in the area, trimming it back it can be a great time to do that in the, the early spring. Also, if you have sediment or litter in your rain garden, that's another great early spring project. Sometimes you'll have some of that left over from the winter time. Also, if your inlet gets blocked, here's an example of one of those road cuts a rain gardens you can see the gutters right along here and there's a road cut here so the rain garden is gonna come right off that and take some street storm water but sometimes there'll be some sediment or, or sand from the winter time so you want to clean those out and make sure that the the entrance is ready you might have to weed along the edge sometimes grass or other things will sort of move in so so weeding along the edge to dig out those cool season grasses lawns sometimes try to infiltrate rain gardens so if you have edging that will deal with a lot of that problem but sometimes some grass will try to get in there so so keeping those grasses out is an important thing to do in the early you might have to put some more mulch in if, if your mulch is already decomposed, putting in some 
Mulch, and there's a specific kind of shredded hardwood mulch, is the, the best to use because that shredded hardwood mulch sort of links together and doesn't get washed away the way that those wood chips will. And so springtime is a good time to get that mulching in, and that also will help keep weeds out of the area. Depending on what you've planted, it might be time to divide some of those plants. Um, if they're getting the donut shape to them, they're dead in the middle and alive on the outside, then usually those are plants that you need to split. Sometimes you can split them and move them to different parts of your rain garden, split them and share them with your friends, or plant them in some other part of your property. But sometimes just as the, the plants are growing, they need to be divided. And again, spring's a good time for that. Here's someone that looks like they're using an ax to divide up plants. So it's sometimes a serious project to do. You might have to deal with deer. Uh, deer will, especially in the edge of town, they'll come in, but they'll sometimes go further into town as well. And there are some plants that you love to eat. And so that might be something to deal with. Swim around also, depending on what you have planted, a lot of these are really specific with what you put in your rain garden, but staking your plants up can help them do better in the springtime. Staking things down so that they'll be doing okay. Once you get into summertime, it might be time for some weeding. And we'll talk about this some more in the next section, but one thing that folks have done that makes it really easy to weed is sort of planting in clumps if you have if you have one kind of plant in an area you can really look in there and see what doesn't look like my one plant in this part of the rain garden pull them out because they're all weeds and so having clumps of flowers then it's easier to identify what's a weed and what's not a weed as you're going along and also you might have plants die occasionally that does happen and so replanting where the plants are not doing well. You might try different species. If there's one plant that didn't thrive in that area, you might want to swap out for a different native plant that might do a little bit better. And if you're putting in new plants, young rain gardens need about an inch of water a week as they're getting established. And this is most of an, mostly an issue the first year of a rain garden. Once they're established, you don't need to water as much, but just making sure that there's enough water, that's, that enough rain or hose water that's getting to those plants for that first year so that they're doing okay. One inch of water per week is the standard and, and often summer rainfall will do that naturally, but if not, you wanna make sure that you're adding that in. Late summer, you might have to, to weed again because those annual plants are finding space and getting growing. You wanna clear them out and then remulch the area because the mulch will help keep those weeds from getting established. You might also have some flowers you wanna bring in as bouquets. Uh, not technically a maintenance thing, but it's a benefit of rain gardens. And then once you get to fall, you might wanna collect seeds to then replant in your area or share them with friends because if you have native plants there, you'll, you'll have seeds that you can eat either put into the rain garden itself or use in other areas. A lot of times leaving some of those tall prairie plants standing is great in the wintertime. It provides habitats and, and seeds food for native uh, animals. In winter, you might have some other visitors. You have the deer in the summer, but you might have rabbits in the winter. If you have, there are some rain gardens that do have woody plants, bushes in them, and rabbits love eating those. So you might have to fence or find other ways to keep the, the rabbits from coming into your area. Sometimes there are smell barriers. I'm always a big fan of physical barriers are better than chemical barriers. So fencing, you don't have to create a barrier that a rabbit can't get through. You just have to make it harder to get to your plants than to get to your neighbors. And then the deer will, or deer and rabbits will hop over somewhere else. The more challenging the situation is for them, the, the more likely they'll go someplace else in the process. The, there is an example of a have a heart trap here. I'm not a huge fan of have a heart because if you do capture an animal and move it somewhere else, most of the time they come right back. And so if you are in a situation where you need to trap, trapping with lethal traps can be a solution. Have a hearts generally move the problem to someone else or the animal comes right back again. And so so, but fencing your plants so that the deer or rabbits can't get to them has been very effective because then they've got to go find someplace else for food in the process. For those not familiar with Master Gardeners, it's a program that's run through the University of Minnesota Extension. And Master Gardeners are trained by University of Minnesota Extension staff to help people doing gardening. And it isn't only rain garden, it's all kinds of gardening, but it's a free service here in Minnesota. Well, it's, it's a service that we as Minnesotans pay for through our taxes and other support of the University of Minnesota Extension. But these are folks that their mission is to help people do gardening in Minnesota. And so you can reach out to University of Minnesota Extension and, and get connected with the Master Gardener. And their job is to help you with any kind of gardening on your property, talking about soil type and plantings, but they're also trained to talk about rain gardens. And so that's a great resource. And here are some more examples of resources. So my name's Cole Johnson, for those of you that don't know me, and I am the water quality technician with the, with the city of Northfield. Realistically, if anything relates to stormwater, I more than likely deal with it. So that's my job in a nutshell. 
Um, I'm just here to talk to you a little bit about our rain garden cost share program. Give you a little bit of background information. I think this may be the 10 year anniversary that we've had the program. I think it was formally adopted around in 2012. Originally brought on as a suggestion from our environmental quality commission and we ran a pilot program the first year and then formally adopted the program and we've been doing the cost share ever since and the rain garden workshop since 2015 now. So the city will supply or will pay for 50% of the cost of the rain garden up to $250. So for you to get the full credit of the, you'd have to spend $500 on rain garden materials and it pretty much covers everything that you can think of when it comes to planting a rain garden. If you want to go rent an excavator and dig your hole, we'll pay for that. Not the whole thing, obviously, because they're very expensive but we will essentially pay for tools and equipment used to do the excavation work with a rain garden. Also, if it, they're going through the process and thinking that this sounds like it's a little bit overwhelming for me this year, the city does also have other rebate programs centered around water quality and water conservation. We do have, like Kevin said, our native plant rebate program and our rain barrel rebate program. You can get money back for participating in those. And we're hoping to have another water conservation type rebate program here in the near future. That's more dealing with toilets and shower heads and things of that like. So that doesn't relate exactly to uh, stormwater, but it does relate to our drinking water. So a real quick review about rain gardens and kind of what they are. So it's a shallow depression, three to nine inches deep. So we're not talking about a deep pit. We're talking about something that as you step back, it's going to look like probably a regular planting bed. Now the surface should be dry in 48 hours. We shoot for 24 and that gives you a lot more options in terms of what will grow in that rain garden. So our goal is to get everything, all the water out of the surface within 24 hours. Sometimes we'll do some soil amendments and I know that question came up of what do we do? I'll cover that with the compost and how we put that in at what time and how much we need. We usually plant them with deep rooted plants. Those plants help not only to kind of soak up the water and evaporate it up into the air, they also kind of, the roots as they go down through the soil will create Crepe, and the water can help infiltrate or will infiltrate a little bit quicker as those roots develop too. And then uh, we want to design it so it matches your landscaping. We don't want it to stick out like a sore thumb. We want it to be something that looks good in your yard. And then we can select some plants that will attract wildlife. If you want to attract bees or birds, there's a lot of different species you can choose for that. So this is just a, a quick kind of before and after sequence here. So on the top left, I took that picture standing on the street on top of the storm drain. So the water from the downspout flows right through and into the storm drain, so down into the pipe and out to the river. So we wanted to put a rain garden to capture that on its way. So nothing fancy, we just wanted to drop that, plop it right in the middle there. So in the second picture here, you can see we removed the sod and we're just starting to dig that shallow depression. So the soil that's dug out here is just getting shifted a little bit to create what we call a berm just a raised area that's gonna hold back the water. So once that was done, we've got this area, it's a little bit higher. This is our depression, it's nice and flat on the bottom. So the water comes in and it spreads out evenly, gives it more room to soak into the ground. Then we use some rocks up front just to kind of make that step back down to the, to the lawn. So this is right after it's planted and this is a year later. So now when it rains, water comes out of that downspout, collects in the rain garden and doesn't make it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through this cost share application. So starting at the top, first page is all pretty straightforward. Contact information, general questions. Do you have drainage issues right now? If you've got drainage issues with like next to a foundation, we don't wanna make anything worse. We wanna make sure we can address that separately we want to rule out areas where maybe it's not a great spot for a rain garden. So we want to kind of separate those two. Are you willing to maintain it? And that's just, what, do you know what you're getting into? And basically the maintenance is, it's like any perennial planting bed. If you can maintain a flower garden, you can maintain a rain garden. And then can, this, can it be used for site tours? I don't know if Cole's got any plans to load up a bus and tour Northfield, look at all the rain gardens, but eventually hoping to do that. And then uh, the other information is just kind of when you plan to install and How'd you hear about it? All right, so the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna sketch out your property. And you can either do this by hand, or if you have like a lot survey, when you're, say when your house is built, that survey shows a lot of detail and a lot of information, and those can be used. Otherwise, you can use like a Google Earth image, and we're just looking for something that kind of shows what's there, where's the water coming from, and where's the rain garden located. The other thing you wanna do is call go for one because you wanna know where those utilities are before you start. If you've got an electric line or a gas line right below where you wanna put that rain garden, it's probably gonna change your plans, and it's best to know that up front rather than having everything set and then getting utilities marked right before you're ready to dig and find a spider web of all these painted lines going right through where you want your rain garden. So once you've got that done, you've got a 
got your base plan, you know where your utilities are, that's when you start looking at where your ideal locations are. So you want to go at least 10 feet away from the house because we are soaking water into the ground. We don't want to put additional water next to the foundation. So that 10 feet gives us some space. We don't want it over the utilities. We don't want it over a septic system. If you're in town, that's probably not an issue. But if you're out of town, you want to make sure where your septic tank and drain field is. Areas that are relatively flat or easier. Like I said before, it's not impossible, but it's a lot less work if you can find a flatter area. And then we want to make sure we're above bedrock. Not a huge issue in most parts of Northfield, but there are some areas kind of by downtown where bedrock is probably five, six feet below the surface. So we just want to make sure that we're avoiding those situations. And then the other things to put in there, it's easiest if you know where your water's coming from, you can locate it close to that source. So you're not trying to redirect water all the way through your property to a different location. So it just kind of, like we did in that, that sequence that I showed, just kind of drop it in where that water's flowing already. And then uh, not directly under trees. We don't want to damage a tree, a large mature tree. It's not, a, I hate to trade that off for a rain garden. So we'd look for places that are not directly underneath those trees. All right, so when we're, when we're figuring out how big the rain garden is, we need to know two things. We need to know how much water is coming to the rain garden and how fast is it soaking into the ground. And that'll help us figure out what that size is. So to figure out how much water is coming, we wanna look at the drainage area. And so with this, it's best to just look at the hard surfaces. But there's gonna be some runoff from your lawn as well, but it's easiest when we're calculating this, just look at the hard surfaces where nothing's soaking in. So your rooftop, sidewalk, driveway, just those what we call impervious surfaces. And what we're trying to do is really capture about the first inch of runoff. So if we get if we get a normal rain, a lot of times we get those quarter inch or half inch rains. If we can capture the first inch, we're going to capture all that. If we get a big rain that's going to be four inches, at least we can capture that first inch of what we can on the property and some of it may run out. But over the course of the year, most of those rains are in the smaller range. So if you can capture the first inch, you're getting about 90% of the total rain for the year which is pretty good. So that's kind of a good goal to go for. You could build it a lot bigger and try to get a higher amount, but it's kind of diminishing returns as you get bigger and bigger. So in this situation, we've got 150 square feet on top. Well, that's the, the upper portion up here that drips down onto this portion of the roof. Get another 450 square feet there that comes into the downspout. So our total drainage area is gonna be 600 square feet in this case. And you can do that on your property too. Just look at the area of your rooftop that goes to the rain garden, or if you've got sidewalk or driveway that goes there, just add all that up and that'll tell you how much water is going to get to it. So now that we know how much water is coming to the rain garden, we want to know how fast that water soaks into the ground because we don't want it stand, sitting there for more than 24 hours. So you can do a couple things. You can do an infiltration test and that's basically digging a hole, getting the ground around that hole fully saturated and then adding more water and just seeing how quickly that water soaks in. And that'll tell you how fast that water is going to go in over the course of a day. The best way to do that is to, to dig that hole, take a garden hose, fill it up. I usually fill it up a few times, kind of let it soak in, because initially that water will kind of wick into the soil really quickly, and then over time it slows down a little bit after everything gets saturated. And you want to know what the speed is when it's fully saturated, because that's, you know, after a, a day-long rain, that's the condition that you're going to be dealing with. So that's what I did here, dug a hole. I don't like to sit idle, so I usually dig another hole or another third or fourth and figure if one's good, two's better. But just fill them up, and then I usually just put a marker up on top, a pencil or a popsicle stick or something, and then you can walk away. Just figure out where it's at, set a timer, walk away, give it an hour or two, and then come back and measure how much water soaked in. And then if you do the math on that, you can figure out how much is going to soak in over the course of a day. So just to kind of put up a hypothetical situation. So if you had an inch of water that soaked in over a four hour period, you can say, that, okay, it's got a quarter inch per hour. So over 24 hours, we're gonna get six inches per day. And that's gonna tell you kind of that 24 hour span, how much water can you pool up? The oil is gonna be gone in 24 hours. So it's not sitting there too long. So now that we know the amount of water, we know how fast it soaks in, we can then figure out how big that rain guard needs to be to capture that first inch. So if you take your drainage area, and in this case, we've got 600 square feet, and you divide it by the depth of your rain garden, so that's how much water can you pool at one time. So we, we figured six inches from that infiltration test. 600 divided by six, you're looking at a 100 square foot rain garden to capture the first inch off of that rooftop. And so that would be your target or your goal for the rain garden size. So 100 square feet is probably a typical size. 100 to 150 is pretty reasonable. If you start getting into the 200 or 300 square feet, that gets to be a quite a bit bigger project. It's a lot of dirt to move. It's a lot more work, more plants, more mulch. So then 
you look at it a lot more in depth and a lot more. So if you go through this process and you've got a huge drainage area, it's not soaking in real quick, and you come up with a number that's ginormous, let's say a 2,000 square foot rain garden, that's probably bigger than what you want to take on. So then you can scale that back and just make sure that if the water's coming in there, you can fill up the rain garden on whatever size works on your property, but just make sure you allow for like an overflow so that the extra water can flow out of it. So capture what you can. We realize you can't capture everything, but you also we also realize you can't fill up your entire yard with the rain garden. I think kind of that 100 to 150 square feet is ideal. And that tends to be like a two weekend project. The first weekend is removing sod and doing kind of the dirt work. And then the second weekend is planting and mulching. All right, so now we know the, how many square feet we've got. So a lot of different options for the design. You can do pretty much anything with the shape. So in this case, we've got rooftop runoff comes through here underneath this little walkway through a dry creek bed and then into the rain garden here. There aren't any plants in this one yet. You can do something that adds on to your existing landscaping. Uh, I did something like this at, at my house. So if you've got kind of a landscape edge there and your water's coming out, you can just add an extra lobe onto that, kind of this crescent shape here. And your rain garden goes right up, so it just expands on the existing. It doesn't really change the shape a whole lot, but it adds that depression. And it doesn't have to be round. It can be kind of any shape that fits. Again, as long as that bottom is as flat as you can get it, so that the water spreads out, any shape will work. So there's a lot of different landscaping uh, design books you can use. A lot of times the raised beds, you can use the same thing. So if you take a raised bed instead of a berm, big a depression and incorporate your rain garden that way. If you're trying to figure out you know, what shape works, so you've got a, a place for it, there's a little trick that a landscape architect friend of mine taught me. He said, just figure out where you want it. So say you want to put a rain garden here somewhere and take a kind of a focal point. So say this is the, the deck in the back of the house and you're going to stand here looking out this direction. Just draw three lines that kind of intersect that. And then on those lines, put a point on the midpoint of each one of those. And then around those midpoints, just draw three random circles. It can be any size. Then you connect the lines around the outside and you've got a shape. And so that's a great way to do it. I like to do this with tracing paper. You can do one shape, slide it over, do another one until you come up with something that really works for your property. So it's an easy way to kind of look at different options without having to commit to anything. And then the, the rain garden itself, it can be really formal like this. So I've got these nice straight edges or it can be pretty informal, kind of the country garden look. So you can do pretty much whatever you want in terms of the shape itself. One thing I really like about this one, it's got this really neat edge. It's got the box edge around it. But if you look at the inside, once you're inside that, it's completely random. So by having that edge, it really makes it formal and neat, but then you don't have to spend all the time making sure every individual plant inside of that is perfect. Another example of kind of like the, the straight edges and hard lines versus kind of the, a little bit more of a cottage look or the country garden for it. The other thing you may want to consider is do you have certain views that you want to kind of either filter or create some privacy? Uh, this situation was uh, there's two sets of townhomes on either side, and then we built rain gardens down the middle, and this is a little bit like an ice cube tray. The water comes in on one end, fills up the first rain garden, it drops down a little bit. Once the first one's full, it fills up the second one, and it fills up the third, the fourth, all the way down. And so we've got a whole series of rain gardens right through there. And in this situation, they didn't want to be staring out their windows right at each other. So we used some trees and some shrubs and that have some height, have a little bit of privacy there that helped provide some screening, but worked really good in that rain garden. So we've got some river birch in there, some red osier dogwood that were in there, and then like joe pie and a few other plants that are a little bit taller that fit into it. Then another trick, I haven't touched on this too, is just kind of that grouping and clustering. So it makes your maintenance a lot easier. If you can take a lot of the same species of plant and put them together in a clump, all you have to know are those few plants. And if it's not one of those, it's a weed. It's kind of like the old Sesame Street uh, skit where you know one of these things is not like the other. As long as what's supposed to be in there, everything else is easy to figure out as a weed and you just pluck those out. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to know every plant. All you have to know are the specific plants that are in your rain garden. Everything else, you know, is easy to maintain. And that grouping and clustering works really good for small plants too. This is prairie smoke. It's only about four inches tall. So I planted probably, uh, there's probably 50 plants together in this cluster, but it blooms really early in the spring, about the same time as the tulips bloom. And so it's a kind of a nice spring native plant. And then sometimes you can combine kind of the aesthetic look. So you know, kind of a, uh, here we've got kind of a water feature, a dry creek bed with the kind of the function that you need. So I was standing in the rain garden for this one and we need to get the water from the downspout here to the rain garden and wanted to maintain a walkway that goes to the backyard. And so it's a, a dry creek bed, a bunch of different types of stone to kind of give it a really neat look to it. Got uh, a limestone kind of little bridge here. And this one was really neat because the, uh, the homeowner on this one had two young daughters and every time it would rain, they would run to this window 
and watch the water cascade over the rocks and fill up the rain garden. So it was a really good learning experience for them. They'd see where that water's going, how it's soaking in, you know, and it's combining kind of a really neat look to it. It's kind of this flowing creek when it rains, but it's really functional. If you've gotten through that, you've kind of figured out how big your rain garden needs to be, kind of where it's going to be located, the shape of it. Now we're getting into the nuts and bolts of how do you actually build it. So for the excavation, the few methods listed. So the first one is a shovel. I've done that a lot. I would not recommend it. Uh, a lot of times you end up in, the pla in places like this where it's really compacted. I got 180 pounds jumping up and down in that shovel and it only went in an inch or two. So it doesn't always end well for me. You got sore feet and sore back by the time you're done. It doesn't always end out well for the shovel either. So there's other methods that are a little bit easier than this. You could rent a mini backhoe. I uh, mentioned this too, you know, something that the city would cover as, uh, as one of your expenses. You can use that and remove the sod. You can dig the basin. You can move your soil and everything into it if you, as long as you're able to operate it. They're really fast. They're really fun. I really enjoy those. You do have to have some way to haul it back and forth. One of the uh, side effects though is that you tend to get all these random holes from like test spots and just kind of practice areas. But uh, yeah, one of those works great. It's just a bigger piece of equipment. But what's most commonly used, and this is kind of the, the stand or like the old go-to now, is just using a tiller. So instead of taking a shovel and trying to dig every thing out by hand. Take a tiller, make a pass through your rain garden area, and just take a garden rake and rake it over to where the berm needs to be. Another pass with the tiller and do the same thing. And eventually you'll start digging down that rain garden and building up the areas where you need to hold back the water. And so it's a lot easier than trying to dig by hand. It's just a matter of making those passes. It doesn't take all that long. The tiller really breaks things up, pulverizes that soil, and it's easy to move it around then. It's one of those kind of kind of how long are you willing to wait. You can save a fair amount of money if you have some patience, but if you want the instant gratification, there's options for bigger plants. You can't even go as big as like gallon pots. So those are gonna run you, you know, anywhere from like 10, probably up to about $15 a piece. You know, and that, that's another year older typically for the plant. And you can do shrubs too. So if you're looking at some of the shrubs that do well in rain gardens, like black chokeberry or red osier dogwood, some of those you can get them in, in either number one or number two size pots you know, for probably around that $30 per plant. The shrubs obviously take will take up more room in your rain garden. So you don't need as many of those. The perennials, like the a lot of the flowers and a lot of the grasses, they're not quite as big, and so you want to plant those a little bit closer together. My general rule of thumb is about 18 inches apart for most of the native plants will give you a nice solid garden when they're mature. If you want to have groupings with a little space in between, then maybe you go with a few less plants and just do those in, in little pockets. But based on the size of your rain garden, you can kind of estimate how many plants you'll need, kind of use that 18 inch spacing. All right, so the materials, this is that soil amendment that we've been talking about. So when you start digging your rain garden, first thing you're, you're going to dig out of that area is going to be your good topsoil. And so a lot of times then you'll get into some of the subsoils that aren't quite as good, it'll be a little more yellowish or not quite as dark brown. Those soils, we want to make sure that we amend a little bit to get some organic material in there. And we also want to add some compost to keep it from getting recompacted. Because if that ground is really compacted and solid, it's not going to let water soak in. So the compost helps to break that up and also provide some nutrients for the plants. So this is leaf litter compost. It's basically like grass clippings and leaves that have been decomposed. Really high nutrient value and good organic material, so they'll be really good for your plants. Per rain garden, usually you need about a cubic yard of this. So it's about the back of a, what you load in the back of a pickup truck. You can get this from the, uh, the Northville compost site. The compost site here is probably the best city site that I've seen. It's really well aged. You can just take a trailer or a truck and load up what you need. And so looking at so about a cubic yard is probably your, your estimate. This gets mixed into the soil. So after you get the rain garden shaped, you put a layer of this on the bottom and then take your tiller and mix it in as good as you can. You want it to all be kind of one even color as deep as that tiller will go. So get that compost down because that's where the roots are going to go to try to grab those nutrients. So after you've got your rain garden shaped, so you got the flat bottom, you've got a berm that's going to hold back the water, the sides kind of gently sloped in, then you want to cover everything with wood mulch. So you're looking for a shredded hardwood mulch. So you don't want to use chips and you don't want to use bark because both of those float. And since we're putting water directly into this rain garden, when it floats, it's all gonna shift to one side and the water goes down, you got a big pile of wood chips on one side of your rain garden. This shredded hardwood mulch forms a little more of a mat and it kind of locks together. So when the water comes in, it just kind of lifts a little bit and it drops right back where it was. So definitely look for shredded hardwood mulch. And you're looking for about three inches deep so a cubic yard covers just over a hundred square foot rain garden. And you can get this in like the natural color. You can get almost any other color of dye with it. If you want to have something that matches the rest of your landscaping, it's pretty easy to find that. And then uh, the other thing you want to look at is edging. The first year you may not notice much, but after a year or two, that 
turf grass will kind of creep. It expands a little bit, and pretty soon your rain garden will get smaller and smaller, and you'll have to start weeding all that grass out. So the edging just kind of keeps that from getting into your rain garden, and creates a nice defined edge. The roots aren't very deep on that turf grass, so if you've got edging that's four inches deep, it's not going to cut underneath that and come up on the other side. Plastic edging on the top right is what's most commonly used. I would recommend getting like the commercial grade edging. Sometimes the coils that you can get at some of the like the big box stores, it's just a, it's like a lighter plastic and that stuff ends up popping out of the ground really quickly. But if you can get the commercial stuff, it's sold in usually 20 foot sticks. You can kind of curl them around and get them into a vehicle, but they're usually kind of laid out in the full 20 foot length. Those tend to work the best. I usually double up on the number of stakes that are recommended because it's easy to put those in initially. It's not as easy to put those stakes in later. Those are just the pins that hold it down in, in the ground. The aluminum edging is an option. Don't see that a whole lot. Steel edging, both those are really nice for kind of nice straight, kind of thin lines, but they're a little more difficult to work with. A lot of stone options, like the bullet edging, it's got a convex side on one end and a concave on the other and you just place those end to end and you can create whatever shape you want that's this stuff up here that's pretty easy to work with and easy to find you can get solid concrete edging poured and that estimate is probably low now i would say it's probably more in the eight to ten foot ten dollars per linear foot and then natural stone and brick there's all kinds of different styles material types colors so you, you can kind of choose anything under the sun for that so that's one of the lines you want to fill in I'll kind of pick your edging type and then you may not know exactly how much you need i just use a rough estimate if you've got 150 square foot rain garden it's about 60 linear feet of edging kind of depends on how it's shaped and what the dimensions are but that's going to get you right in that ball. and then the other option to fill out there anything else so whether you've got landscape rock if you're building retaining walls you want to include that mini excavator anything that you need to rent for that all right and then getting water to to the rain garden it's got a few options one is to just extend the downspout so you can in this case you would want to go a little farther i get down to the bottom of the rain garden the other option is to to bury a pipe or drain a drain tile basically that goes from the downspout goes into some sort of a catch basin or pipe and then gets transferred to the rain garden this catch basin here this the water goes into and goes through the pipe this is a little attachment that goes on the end of your downspout when the water comes down if there's any leaves or sticks in it they catch this grate and slide out the front so they don't get inside that drain tile and plug everything up so if you're using a pipe to get to the rain garden you want to include that so once it's into the pipe you can use either drain tile it's really nice because it's flexible if you've got rocks or anything you can go around those for tree roots if you've got a straight shot you can use a pvc pipe and that runs about two dollars a foot for the pvc 50 cents for the drain tile and then at the end of that you want to make sure that you get it to somewhere where it's not going to just come shooting out the end and scour out the rain garden or cause any damage so you can put like river rock at the base of that so your water's coming from your downspout through this pipe coming out hits that rock and kind of dissipates the energy so it doesn't push all your mulch away i would recommend putting like a what's called a critter guard basically it's a cap so that if you've got the neighborhood rabbits that like to crawl into things or squirrels or chipmunks they don't crawl up into there and plug up your drain tile you can also use what's called a pop-up emitter so you just connect to this it's a spring-loaded top and there's water in it there's enough pressure that it pushes this up lets the water out once the water's done flowing this snaps right back in place this is kind of the, the no extra work step so if your water is coming out of downspout and it's already flowing through where that rain, rain garden is going to be you don't have to do anything extra no sense in trying to divert water around or sending it to a different route just let it flow where it wants to so if you can do this this is definitely going to save you a little bit extra time then you don't have to deal with any of the water conveyance you just know that the water is going right to the rain garden so you can see it just comes in fills right up another option is a vegetated swale it's a great kind of end product but getting it there is tough because you're taking an area where water's flowing digging it up and trying to plant things and so if it rains a lot during the time that those plants are establishing it can be a little bit tough you have some erosion that can happen so this one if you really want to do it you can but you'd have to use extra steps like erosion control blanket or something that's going to hold that soil in place until all the plants are established option is a dry creek bed i really like this one i just like the look of it any sort of dry creek bed where the water can come out flow through and go right to your rain garden and then another option is a stone or concrete spillway. Here's one off the street where there's a lot of water coming through. So it's just a little kind of a concrete trough almost that goes into the rain garden. You can do those, they're a lot of work. I prefer like a dry creek bed over that. Another option is you can do like a PVC pipe underneath. You end up digging a big hole on one side. I use the pipe as a sleeve and use like a garden hose with a jet nozzle. And you can kind of use that to work your way through. So you don't have to dig a huge hole and hollow everything out. It's kind of a messy process, but it works. So that's option two. Option three would be to 
soft cut a section of that concrete out and do what's called a trench drain. And so it's like a grate that goes over the top, but then the water can kind of pass through just below that. So you can still walk over it, but it's got like a, almost a gutter that goes from one side to the next. So the equipment, we've got a tiller. I'd highly recommend using one of these. You're probably gonna end up renting it for the full day. Well, if you've got it where you, you wanna be able to dig that area out and shape everything and then use it to mix in your compost, it's gonna take you more than just a few hours. Plus you have the loading and unloading time to get back and forth. So I'd plan on just having a full day rental for that. You do wanna do something that's a rear tine tiller. The front tine just kind of bounces over the surface and walks. The rear tines will cut in a little bit better. And then at least a five horsepower engine on it. An eight is a little bit better. It's got a little more heft to it, but they will kind of throw you around a little bit as you get into the bigger tillers. And then uh, sod cutter, if you've got a lot of sod tree move, this is great. It's much better than like the, the kick sod cutters. I've wrecked, I don't know, a couple pairs of boots with those probably wrecked my knees already but this you set it you go back and forth over everything it cuts it leaves it in nice strips you can take those strips and roll them up and either use them somewhere else on your property or you set them on the curb with a sign saying free sod and it's gone in no time but these are really slick you'll spend more time picking it up and unloading it than actually using it it'll take you 10 minutes to run through everything, cut it and load up and go. But uh, usually worth the, the effort of getting the machine. And then uh, the delivery. So if you don't have a truck or trailer, you can get that delivered. You're looking at probably $75 for a delivery fee from either a mulch company or somebody who has the compost. And neither one of these are real heavy. So you don't need a heavy duty truck to do it. It's just the volume. It's just a lot of material to haul. Plant delivery, you can have those delivered too. If you're using plugs, it's surprising how many plants you can get into a small area. I think we've got about 3,000 plants in the back of this minivan. So, I mean, you can see that you can load those up in the trunk. You can a backseat of a car, just put some plastic down so nothing gets dirty. And if you want it delivered, there are a lot of the plant suppliers that will either deliver it to your house or they'll meet you at kind of a central location if they're not located somewhere nearby. So then we get into the cost totals. We've got our plants, materials, equipment, and delivery, and come up with the total cost. Cost per square foot isn't real important. It just kind of gives you a ballpark of where you're at, just as kind of a comparison to some of the others. So the cost for this can vary quite a bit. It really depends. Are you doing retaining walls? Are you looking at really large plants? Or are you looking at plant plugs? Are you doing something fancy with your edging? I mean, I've seen rain gardens anywhere from under $100 if you're starting your own plants and getting everything in to several thousand dollars for stuff that's got a little bit more kind of structural components with whether it's stone or block or something in it. So it really depends on what you're planning, but you can really make the project affordable if you're willing to, to put in the time and effort to do it.